We go. <laughs> Kate. Yes, ma'am. Hi, it's Lawson Kelly. Hey, Lawson, how are you? Doing good. How about you? Well, you know, we're hanging on. We're down here in Florida, but we're getting ready to come back. My kids changed their mind. Imagine that. And um, decided they wanted to have do Christmas in the mountains. So since we don't already gotten home, we're driving back. <laughs> oh, me. Oh, but me. it's okay. It's okay. It's kind of scary down here. I mean, people all down here just act like they're on vacation. And so oh. it's very little paying much attention to you know the COVID stuff and yeah it makes us nervous so I think we're going to come back up to the mountain <laughs> Kate help me with your last name um Golston uh, okay the yeah. H the H is silent it's G-H-O-L-S-T-O-N okay okay thank you thank no you. not a problem and I can always tell when they're selling me something because they always say, Mrs. G. Holston. And we yeah. go, oh, mm -mm. <laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> yeah, sure don't. And I don't want to know you probably. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. Well, we got more <clears throat> folks. <clears throat> hey, yeah, Jim. I guess Rob is coming somewhere. <laughs> I hope he'll be here. <laughs> hey, Ginger. But Ginger's muted. I can't get Ginger. Oh, yeah. Ginger. oh hey, I've unmuted. Thank there you. you are. Hey, good morning. I'd everybody. like to hear Robert too, but I can't. He... Robert, you got to do your microphone. Well, maybe he doesn't want to. Ginger, well, there's Irving. Well, I didn't want to, but I decided I would with your urging. <laughs> You heard me. You were. Uh, you could hear me it. without the microphone, probably as loud as I am. I was doing my email. <laughs> oh, okay. We wanted you, Robert. <laughs> hey, how you doing, Rich? <laughs> it's Lawson. 
on uh, he about five on me. Very good. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, dear. Morning. Good morning. Hey. Good morning, Amy. Hey. Hey, hey Lawson. And good to see you. How's everything in the mountains? Hey, Herb. How's everything in the mountains? It's good. I'm about to go back. Where are you? I'm I'm in uh, Metairie in New Orleans. Oh, I used to live in Mandeville, Covington. Oh, that's, a, that's a nice area. St. Tammany is a great parish. It was fun. <laughs> hey, Laura. Good morning. Good morning. Rich, Good morning. I thought you went to Trinity for some reason. Uh, I'm sorry, say again? I thought you went to Trinity in New Orleans. I I, uh, I do go to Trinity. Okay. Uh, I, as, but my I'm almost shifting my home, certainly my home for, uh, church philosophy has shifted much more toward uh, Good Shepherd than it does to uh, Trinity's a little bit to the to the left of where I am. <laughs> oh, really? More, more than more than a little, <laughs> but I'm struggling along. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, everybody. Good to. Good morning. Rob. We're glad you came. We've been talking for a while. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I we had yeah. some. Uh, We're teething. Had, had some. That's all right. Had just had some pressing things to get to, um, and just to let y'all know, because some of y'all are going to get this call. We we've had a potential exposure to COVID at the church. Oh dear. Um, not oh, somebody dear. who has COVID, but somebody who is exposed to somebody who has COVID, and we're waiting on those tests. And just sort of out of abundance of precaution, we're going to, for the Thursday service today, Ginger and, and Laura and Lawson, we're not going to have that today. Oh, God. Well, Rob, the one time I came back to church after a couple of years. I know. I didn't say <laughs> I Sunday now. <laughs> Sunday's, still Sunday's still on. Sunday's still on. So don't worry about that. It's just Thursday that's not. So, no, you didn't... Uh, you didn't curse us, Ann. I was so glad to see you church. <laughs> no, no, can you can you catch it through Zoom? You got a, <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. I think you're all right. Well, I'm sorry for the cancellation, and I'm sorry for the reason for cancellation. But <sighs> you have to do what you have to do. Well, I think it's just good to be cautious right now. There's spikes and things, and we can. We can settle okay. down and, and let the air rest and the building rest and all that. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of circle back and see what's happening. Rich, okay. you survived the, the most recent storm last week. Y'all did okay down there? Uh, yes, we, we, uh, we, have, we lost power for about a, oh, almost a week, but I have an, an automatic generator, which I also have one up in, in our place in Highland, but that uh, carried us for the, the whole time, so we had no... Uh, major problems all a bunch of tree limbs down but uh no no damage to the house and that's the important thing and no high water or anything like that good and no damage to y'all too so that's oh, good well. too uh, <laughs> <laughs> no no damage to us there you go there you go well i'm, I'm uh this is uh installment number four of this class i'm glad that y'all are here for it let's uh let's have a prayer and, and we can begin these discussions let us pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, as we gather to discuss this movie, The Green Book, may we remember the good book. May we remember mm -hmm. your son, his teaching, the prophets, like Micah, who taught us to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. Your son, who said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and help us to see each other in this situation with open hearts and new eyes and with listening and understanding that can help us grow closer to you and stronger in relationship to one another and bring healing to those things that need healing. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So um, the green book, is this the... For, for whom was this the first time you had seen this like this week? something new for y'all or had you seen it recently rich seen it lawson i'd, I'd seen it before yes. yeah we we had it at movie night uh sometime whenever we were doing that again i can't remember i guess it was back a year ago or something like that uh 
it's it's a good one. It's up to date, uh, like the one we had, uh, Just Mercy. It's based on a true story, like the one we'll have next week with Hidden Figures. It's based on a true story. Um, you just died too. Yes, I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so set in set in 1962, uh, this is a story of a uh, of a white man and a black man who come together out of some uh, sort of business type of things. Uh, and unlike driving Miss Daisy, where you have a black man driving around a, a white woman who's Jewish, that could have been a good movie for this course as well. Um, right. You have a you have a white man driving around a, a black man and. Uh, their relationship and how that relationship develops and how it, it changes their hearts. Um, I think in it, there are uh, uh, new ways of looking at class. In other words, the, the, we'll call them Tony Lip. Tony the Lip. Tony Lip. <laughs> who, um, you know, thinks of, thinks of himself as, as someone who really struggles in life to get food on the table. Uh, many generations of, of family there um, some of the interesting balances is, is that, you know, uh, Dr. Shirley is teaching him how to speak just a little more refined English, uh, mm -hmm. not with that Italian thing. Uh, but as you know, it's prejudice and class, a lot of those things uh, in the country and, and certainly highlighted in New York, whether you're Italian or you're Catholic or you're Irish or you're Polish or you're Chinese or you're all those, you know, the little Italy's and all that kind of thing that the some of the ethnic things that come up, the prejudices that might be subtle, but are still there, um, show up in this, in this movie too, in some interesting, interventioning ways. Um, so issues of class, issues of power, like we have talked about, and um, maybe I'll just open it up for our discussion and, and just someone wants to jump in at one of the scenes of the movie that was um, powerful and, and helpful and interesting to you? Oh, I think the fry, eating fried chicken was absolutely in the car. I mean, I, I, what are you gonna do with the bone? <laughs> I'm gonna throw them out the window. That's right, that's right. And the assumption that because he was black, he had to have had fried chicken was, you know, one of the, I think it was one of those universal stereotype things that they threw in, but I loved it because there was this white guy driving him along, saying, "I've got a I got a treat for you." And um, well, your key word there, Kate, I think is assumptions. I think part of yep. this relationship issue that we're talking about and how we can relate to one another sometimes is is being able to check ourselves of what assumptions we're making of, of somebody else, assumption of their skin color, of, uh, of the food that they like, of the upbringing that they've had. I mean, that's what's happening with Tony and, and, and Don in all of this. A lot of times is you people. You don't, you don't know who <laughs> these musicians are. You don't know who Nat King Cole is. You don't know who Chubby Checker is. You don't know, and, and I know them, but I don't listen to their music. So we, we make some of those assumptions and that's, not just along racial lines, of course, that's just around, it can be an assumption about somebody from California or Alaska or Ireland or, or you know, oh, you're from, you must like whiskey if you're from, you know, Irish whiskey. <laughs> no, I may, maybe you do, maybe you don't. I mean, all those, all those kind of things. So it's, it's that self-check that we have. Um, as we talked about last week, we as Southerners with the accents that we have, Sometimes we show up at a place like Milwaukee or Chicago or Connecticut or whatever else, and maybe we're talking a little, a little bit slower than the rest of them or whatever else that might be, and that's just going to make them think that we ain't as smart as they are. And, uh, you know, those, those <laughs> assumptions sometimes are true. Uh, sometimes those assumptions are, are not true, but it's just that what, we, what we assume for that. So what else from that scene, Kate, was was telling for you, was sort of eye-opening for you in terms of the the chicken? <laughs> um, well, I mean, when he threw the cup out the window along yeah. with the bones. Right. And he, and he turned around and he said, wait, you have to go back and get it. And made him pick up the cup because that's environmentally incorrect mm -hmm. <laughs> to leave something like that 
he didn't mind throwing the bones because he I guess he those are will go away, but the, the cup would not. And um the idea that he would know and be concerned of, for example, the environment <clears throat> and the other one wouldn't, it's it's a complete what you would think is a complete reversal. Right. So there are, again, those are the issues of, of class status and, and of culture, what we, what we take care of, how we do those other kind of things. Um, and so that, that mm -hmm. is that way. Anybody else on that scene with the, with the chicken? Rob, I had not, oh, let's see. I had not seen the movie in years. And the, the scene I remembered was the fried chicken scene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was priceless. That's right. Oh. Well, part of it, you know, it comes up again when they're um, in Raleigh, North Carolina at that one house and they're doing the show and they uh -huh. said, we asked, we asked to help what we thought we should make and we made fried chicken. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing, which is... Um, in its own way kind and welcoming and in its in another way maybe a little more stereotypical and we sort of go we sort of at least i sort of grimace and go oh you know uh, this is the only thing this is the only thing this person is going to like is is fried chicken so it there's a there's a both and to to some of that kind of it i thought what was good about that scene in terms of um how you know the title of this class can you relate they're learning to relate to each other. They're learning yeah. to they're learning to get along. They're learning to listen to each other, to try things. And it, it was one of those moments, I think, that actually brings them together when Dr. Shirley realizes, I do like fried chicken and I can eat it this way. And and that's okay. And um, just the laughter and the and the joy that comes with them in in trying something new and trying to see something a different way. Uh, and that's a, that was a nice scene that way. And the letter writing part, the, when he was trying to write a letter to his wife, and um, I, mean, I can't remember their names, said, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you think you, <laughs> that that's going to be a great letter for your wife to receive, let me tell you what you need to say. And mm. he starts dictating this letter to his wife. And the and the husband is writing it down. And of mm -hmm. course, the wife gets it, and she's like, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> oh no, she loved it. <laughs> oh, she, she did it. love it. But I mean, I don't know. I know she must have thought he'd, not, you know, he'd never talk like that. So all of a sudden, he's, mm -hmm. you know, poetic as he's writing. So I thought that was another one of those, just the opposite of what you might think would be happening. Right. She and gave Dr. Shaw a big hug at the end for the yes, letters. Yeah. For the letters. Right. right. And I think that's even what you're saying in that, Kate, is the opposite of what we would think. There is a, unfortunately, there is even a problem in that statement that we would come yeah. to think that a, a black person can't teach a white person about grammar. A black person can't teach a white person about romance, that there, there is somehow something about that that doesn't seem right when it's perfectly reasonable to think that anybody can teach somebody else something and, and share in that, even an unmarried person to a married person, even you know, any of those, any of those kind of things that realize that our, some of our stereotypes or invisible or unconscious thoughts have to get broken down if we're going to relate to each other in way and be open to receiving that kind of information. I mean, that's the thing about um, Tony at that point, he's open to receive it. They're interacting as a human level. And, you know, between men, between women, sometimes it's a pride thing. I'm not going to let you, this is my whatever else. And so they're, they're able to be humble. They're able to be um, open to that. Sandra, you had your hand up. The scene that was most uh, poignant to me was, uh, this was 1961. 62. 62, and uh, Dr. Shirley was caught uh, with a white man that, of course, in immediately identified his sexual preference. And 1962 in the South, um, 
that that would have been um, lynchable. It, it, they they kind of glossed over that, I thought, in terms of, um, you know, I mean, they'd have taken both of them out, lynched them. Let's do it that way. Um, well, I don't know about that, but I think what was revealing is that uh, Tony, who had an, an immediate aversion to Don because of his race, as a strong macho Italian would have had another aversion to him as a gay man. Right. And when that scene came around, he defended him. And that shows the evolution right there. But uh, yeah. the relationship had about three strikes against it, but that was one of the strikes. I agree with you, Sandra. Yeah, and then in the future, they share a hotel room and in the future, they embrace each other. In the future, you know, right. they, they can be they can be friends that doesn't circle around he, some anxiousness about anxi uh, sexual anxiety. <laughs> you know, he's Italian. He's going to hug everybody. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, and he said, you know, it comes up again later when Don Shirley says, I like the next day. Sorry about last night. And Tony says, I've been a bouncer in New York. Life's complicated. You know, it's been, sorry, that was a, a statement of mercy and understanding and I'm not, I'm not judging you. And he, he just, that, that, that lack of judgment or judgmentalism, I guess, that, that came in with that. I did think the cup was funny because uh, when John and I were dating, I threw a milkshake cup out of the car and he backed up and made me pick it up. So it yeah. resonated with me. <laughs> <laughs> true confession. That's right. That's true confession. <laughs> Well, on, on a literary standpoint, I mean, the beginning of the movie, when the, uh, the, the guys come to their apartment to fix the appliance and they have a drink of water and he, he throws away the cup, the glasses. And so you, you see where he was at, at one point in his life and how he just didn't do that. Uh, and then al along the way, there's just a lot, a lot deeper sharing. We wouldn't even wash something. You'd think it'd be forever stained with cooties. Um, so again, that's part of the, the evolution that he's going through. And that's part of what all these stories are, part of it for all of us. We're, we're coming of age. We're, we're learning things about life. There's never a, a time limit on that and what we can learn, what we can learn about ourselves and others. And when we're really in a person-to-person -person situation with somebody, um, they're not removed. They're not the other far off in, in some place, but we're really experiencing it. I mean, I, I, I love the scene and we'll get to it in a few minutes. So towards the end of the movie, when they're uh, screaming at each other in the rain about I'm blacker than you oh. are, you're not blacker than I, I mean, that was just a, a very powerful scene in terms of both of them feeling like the underclass and how, oh. um, and how that feels to be, not accepted um, and that's part of the the relating to I think we can all at some level have have had a, an opportunity to to be there where we're not accepted where we're not welcomed where we're looked down upon um, and some of this ethnicity there was a big scene where he was not accepted at that place where he was supposed to play the piano but could not eat dinner there Right, in Birmingham, yeah. In Birmingham. <laughs> and then he had a really good time playing at the little black cafe. Right. Well, let's I talk about... that was an important scene. I thought it was a little bit over the top, Ginger, um, the way it was depicted. Not to say there wasn't racism in the country clubs, there was. Yes. But uh, just the way the, the actors portrayed it, I thought it was a little bit over the top. But they made the point, and that's Hollywood. Yeah. yeah. Well, I thought, too, <laughs> kind of heavy-handed, you know, all the Northerners are great and accepted, and that policeman at the end in the snow was so helpful, and all the Southerners had these exaggerated Southern accents, and they were, they were, they were definitely the bad guys, and it was a little bit kind of heavy-handed. Yeah. Uh, I thought, but again, Hollywood making a point. I thought it was interesting that he evolved into Little Richard in that uh, <laughs> ball. 
I really, I'm, I'm not as big on jazz as I am on rock and roll. So I love that scene. I thought yeah. that was terrific. Yeah. yeah. It was well, good. The thing well, is that about... book, that, that green book though, I mean, I, I asked someone and they said, yes, that their family had a green book like that, that told them where the places that, you know, don't go there. And if you're going to travel here, this is, you know, where you can probably find someplace to eat. You know, I mean, it existed. It was written down. I mean, you know, it's hard to believe that it's not AAA, you know, kind of the best route for us to go. It is the safest one if you want to eat. You will not be fed at any of these other places. That's so I, I remember it. That's you definitely. remember the you remember the book, Bob? Yes, I remember that the the blacks were certain places they couldn't go. I mean, that was just understood in the Jim Crow South. And my gosh, what do we talk about? Sixty one, sixty two. I was a junior in college at Sewanee, an all male <laughs> Episcopal institution, and I went down to uh, Atlanta to the uh, black schools down there, Spelman and whatnot kind of a hand across the sea type thing. And it was just very interesting. We, we all related pretty well, but we were playing our roles at the same time. But it was a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Well, not, adding to the scene at the, uh, whatever it was, the orange chicken or the orange, whatever else, the orange bird restaurant at the end where he's playing, um, you know, Tony's the only white guy in there. And so he, he walks in and he gets maybe that sent that opposite feeling of being the minority and people looking at him and, and almost coming up to say, are you sure you're here? But you know, he walks in, he's, <laughs> he's got a, he's got a sense of, of confidence with, with that as well. Well, reverse with, uh, this happened in Birmingham, Michigan, but there was a, we like to go to art movies and there was one that we had read about that we wanted to see. And so we're only showing it once and it was like at nine o'clock at night or something. So Joe and I go and I'm looking around and when we sat down, we were the only white people in the theater. Not only that, we were the only straight people in the theater. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, I just, it was just an observation but um, some, something on the screen would happen and, and Joe and I, Joe would just laugh out loud. No, nobody else in the theater made a sound. And then there were times when the whole audience was just laughing and Joe goes, what was so funny? I said, Honey, it's just a totally different sense of humor. Just, it's just okay. We just can't leave. We're just gonna sit right here. The movie's good, but it was a very strange, the sense of humors and everything were just, to, of course, very different, but it, yeah. it's a strange feeling when, you know, but I didn't feel when you're the odd, Yeah, when you're the odd one out, yeah. Laura? Yeah, when I was in college, uh, um, in summer times, I went to live with my um, brother and his wife in Chicago, the south side of Chicago. And they had decided they were gonna try reverse integration. So they were living in an all black neighborhood in an apartment. And he got me these jobs and I would have to walk to the L and early in the morning, like six o'clock um, in this neighborhood. And I actually never felt uncomfortable, but the only people that really, they didn't really bother me, but the cops would drive past and they'd look at me. And it seems like they were always trying to figure out what I was doing there. And, you know, why I was in this neighborhood, but it, it was a very different experience for, for me and I, I enjoyed it greatly. Other scenes from the movie, Irv or Ann or Rich? Oh, well, my, looking at the whole thing, I, I'm 84 years old, born 1936. So I'll live through all of the segregation and the, the, the integration that, that, that followed and, and the turmoil that integration caused because it was such a shift 
in, in a paradigm shift in, in our society. <clears throat> uh, and I looked at a couple of things. One is how things were in 1962 as, as shown in the, in the movie, as opposed to the way things are today and how far we as a society have come to understanding <clears throat> uh, you you just you did not have uh, uh, close back friends like you have like you have today and it just uh, uh, it, it was just the way it's just the way society was at that time it, it was a different different time a different different place in history um, we look back on it, and uh, as we often do, we look and judge things in the past by today's uh, standards, and, and it's that's that's not really a not really a fair thing to do, because unless you have lived there at that time and understood what what the standards were, uh, it's uh, right. No, and I, I think we'll be. I think we'll be judged ourselves fifty years from now, hundred years from now. I think that's that's part of humanity, some rightly, some wrongly, in that not really knowing what's what's going on. But that your your point, Rich, is well taken, and that brings up uh, some of the other parts of the movie uh, that Don surely chose this tour, and the people during this time in the fifties and sixties and seventies who, out of courage chose to do something by way of changing hearts and by way of, um, he was so mad at himself at a couple of points in the movie that he had, um, had not been gracious or he had to, he, cause he was really trying to um, let kindness and gentleness and wisdom and all those other type of things win hearts, not to lose his top when he couldn't, was told to go to the outhouse. Uh, even in the, even in the Birmingham situation where he can't eat here, he didn't, he didn't blow his top. He kept his cool and, and, and those things made a statement, but for people like him who risk their lives in many circumstances uh, to, to make a difference, to change hearts is one of the reasons that we are in a better place now than we were in 62. And the courage, I think that we can show now where we need to show courage in, in all kinds of ways and faith as people of, of uh, Christ and disciples of Christ will be the continued ways that we change hearts. Laws don't really change the hearts. Um, they, they help with injustice, but the way to change a heart is to get to know somebody as these two men get to, to know each other and both of their lives were changed and their, and their friendship continued. Uh, and that was a, a beautiful part of the end credits of this to see how they how they stay close in, in that. You know, Rob, you, you make an interesting point. I think the laws are generally behind society. I'm talking about time-wise. In other mm -hmm. words, I think when race came about with the Brown v. Board of Education decisions and whatnot, society was basically ready for it. And when the uh, same-sex marriage and that sort of thing came about, society was ready for it. But the laws were behind society, time-wise. Society mm -hmm. had already decided that this was a good thing. And yeah. I know there were some malcontents, but by the same token, uh, I think that's an interesting dynamic. And we think that the U.S. Supreme Court led the way in a lot of areas, but it really didn't. It was just trying to catch up. Mm -hmm. and women's suffrage, the same. I mean, and what those things have led to in terms of females who were <clears throat> on the Supreme Court now or in houses of legislature or about to be in the White House or all those other kind of things that we are, we are, making, we are making strides uh, with all that and are looking at somebody else and saying, because of their credentials, they are a valid person for the Supreme Court. They're a valid person to be whatever else in it. We're not um, taking some type of prejudice and saying, well, just because you're this, that, or the other, you wouldn't, you wouldn't qualify this or we wouldn't think this about you. Um, going back to the courage of Dr. Shirley, um, I think it was just the year before he did his tour that Nat King Cole was attacked um, when he was doing a concert in the South and ended up in the hospital. 
um, the Ku Klux Klan stormed the stage. And so, you know, I'm sure Don Shirley would have been aware of that. And yet he, he chose to do the mm -hmm. tour. Sure. Well, when you think of people like Hank Aaron, don't you dare break that home run record. We're, you know, all, all those other kind of things that, that were happening during, and this, you know, that's during my lifetime, um, where, where threats were made because of someone's being other or being different. It's not just race. It's not just black and white. And to Rich's point, we've come a long way. That Those things are fewer and fewer and further between. But the fact that they're still happening in some places shows that we still have some, some work to go. We have a long way to go. I, it's interesting to me, I've had some Northland TV problems recently, and I had two guys from Northland come and do the text to do the servicing on the, the set. And both were, I'd say, relatively young black guys. And they came to my door and you could tell that they wanted to let me know immediately, hey, I'm here for Northland. I'm not here to do any kind of trouble. And their insecurity, initial insecurity is, is still very revealing. And of course, we're in a sundown community being up here in Cashers, but still the intimidation factor, the being uncomfortable coming to a white house, really it, it was twilight. So, I mean, I thought that was revealing. That is. Revealing and sad. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I just one comment, <clears throat> during the period of integration, as things moved ahead, the people most resistant to, to integration were in fact the low class whites because they said to them, their position being the only thing that makes me better than a black man is the fact that I'm white. And the intelligentsia, the, the, the upper class uh, whites accepted it much more readily than, than the people that were uh, in the, especially the, the lower economic uh, uh, white group. And that sort of came out in the movie in the, in the bar scene, that first scene where Dr. Shirley was getting beaten up in the bar. He, had, he didn't fit in with the folks at the hotel, didn't want to play horseshoes, didn't want to be you know, put on the spot there. So he goes to the bar and you know, those four guys who are beating him up are you know, just folks who are looking for somebody to bully and to, to feel better about themselves. And that's, that's part of the sadness, Rich, of the things that you are, are talking about and one of the shades of, of racism that, that's out there. All right, Kate, got to take you off mute. All right. Katie's muted. Yeah, I'm trying to get it unmuted. I can do that on my end, but it's not doing it. Still can't hear you, Kate. Sorry. Any other, uh, while we're waiting on that technical difficulty, any other scenes of the movie that are, uh, that were impactful for you? Carol, have you? No, not, not necessarily a scene in the movie, but um, just a personal experience. Um, when I was teaching preschool in Atlanta, we kept um, one of my students over the weekend and she was biracial. Her mother, excuse me, <clears throat> her mother was white and her father was black. And this was like in 1973. And that was highly unusual. And Toby and I took her to the circus in Atlanta and very few black people there. And just out of habit, she turned to me and said, mama, can I get some popcorn? And everyone around us who were all white just looked at Toby and me with this African-American child and was like, how can she be that little girl's mother? And, you know, I picked her up and took her and got the popcorn, but I'll never forget that. And, and she was, um, she was colorblind. She, she had no clue that she was different. She was the only African-American in the circus, in, in the audience, in the circus. And she happened to be with two white adults. And she just was, you know, because I was her babysitter, was 
hey, mama, can we go get some popcorn? And there was just silence around us. I'll never forget that. And mm -hmm. that was back in like 1973, 1974. And now my kids, they're totally colorblind. They wouldn't even, they, they wouldn't even recognize that anyone is biracial or anything like that. And that's another generation of kids, which would be the same age. That child would have been the same age as my kids at this point. Thank you for sharing that. I thought the final scenes were wonderful because not only did he change, but by by Tony changing, he was able to, you know, change his family. And uh, when he went back home and when he came to the door, I mean, that was, made you cry. And yeah. they, you know, they probably gulped a minute and then said, you know, come on in. And that, that was just a... Um, shows that one person, you're not just changing for yourself, but maybe you can have an influence on your family and the people around you. Exactly, exactly. And that's, when we think about power, <laughs> even in the unconscious kind of thing, that's a, you're not doing it to exercise power, but you're, you're using the, the influence that you have, the power that you have to, to say to other people, here's another human being. They're sitting at the end. Then the, the brother or the cousin says, hey, y'all make room for him. What are you standing there for? And so it wasn't just, it wasn't just Tony that was doing it. And those, those are the things that make a difference. They're not big institutional things. They're the little things along the way that, that make a difference. I did think it was interesting that in the beginning of the movie, uh, Tony could have gone a totally different way because he was constantly being offered little jobs uh, that would have set him apart and uh, he wasn't having any part of it. And that, so that kind of gave you the character of, of Tony right there. Right. That there was some other morality involved. It's like, I'm not gonna, I might beat people up at the bar, but I'm not gonna join the mob essentially is what it looked like I'm, and do, and do worse than that. You know, that reminds me of a, a part of the, um, book of James in the Bible is this is more about economy than wealth but James's point is basically when a, a well-dressed person comes into the church you oh come over here and sit down we'd love for you to I'm really happy that you're here and then if somebody else comes in and they don't have on the nice clothes or whatever else you just you give them a seat in the back and you sort of push them off to the side and um, it's the full welcome versus the half welcome and that's um, telling, and he is, he's really chastising people for that. And that's what happened at the end of the movie, to Anne's point. It was the full welcome. It wasn't the half welcome. Oh, I'm glad you're here. Let's go pull up a, a chair in the kitchen for you to be able to sit down in the kitchen and eat in the kitchen. Um, and I think that was the story last week that you told Sandra, right? When the, when the person came in and you said, no, we're all, almost, we're all gonna eat together. We're gonna have break. We're gonna have lunch here, and she said she took her plate, and went to the kitchen. So we all took our plates, and we went to the kitchen too. <laughs> yeah. And that's a there's a solidarity in that. That's important. Mm. <clears throat> One of the scenes that again to get it back to that scene towards the end of the movie where um, they had just come out of being arrested. Um, for the sun, you know, the sundown laws, you, you can't be black and be out this time of, of day. And it wasn't anything that Shirley did wrong. It was that when Tony got called a, a, an N-word too, you're, you're basically just an Italian uh, low-class person, whatever else. He popped him on the jaw, wasn't going to take it. Um, which again was something that Don Shirley was trying not to do, not trying to lose his temper, not trying to be violent, all those other kind of, of ways. But then they get out of jail and they're having this whole discussion. Um, and Don Shirley doesn't understand what Tony has been through as in, in a sociologically and, and, and feeling like the underclass. And Tony doesn't really understand fully what Don Shirley has been through in all that, even with his refined language and refined living and his wealth and and having this throne in his house, I thought that was an interesting little thing that he is, yeah. <laughs> he was, he was going to have this throne in his house. He was, he was creating this sense where he was reminded that, you know, that I am, I am somebody. And, and part of their relating was, mm -hmm. was Dr. Shirley finally saying, 
the black people tell me I'm not black enough. The white people tell me I'm not white enough. I don't, I don't fit in anywhere. When I'm up on the stage, I'm an entertainer and they love seeing me, but I step off that stage and I'm just a, sorry for the use of this word, I'm just a nigger again to them. And, and I think that that's part of maybe where we've come in a culture to some degree is people that we haven't got to know through music, through athletics, through movies, through other things like that. We, we begin to s relate to people as people and not just somebody who is a, uh, for publicity's sake. Um, and that really, again, begins to change the, the, the tide of things when we can see people in those, in those ways, not just as a star, whether they're white or black or male or female, it's just a human being. It's just a human being with, with foibles and, and uh, shortcomings and insecurities like the, like the rest of us have. But really the place, and almost you're, you're, you're speaking to that a little bit, Carol, in, in your story, um, folks who are, who are black who find themselves sort of in the middle. I'm not fully accepted by the black community. I'm not fully accepted by the white community. And I'm even, I'm even more alone. It's like I've told you last week, I think you're too young to remember her, but Gert Bahanna was um, quite an influence on people of my age. She was an Episcopalian. And, um, you know, she said everybody has to have somebody to look down on. It's just the way it works. And so if you're at the bottom, you know, you have to find somebody. And she said that she realized that she snobbed the snobs. Um, and, and gave, all, gave all her money away so she wouldn't be considered one of those. But mm -hmm. um, that, that it's a natural, my mother, may she rest in peace, did some work, a lot of work in the, the segregated schools. Um, and she even found, she came home and she said, you know, there's a hierarchy in the teachers, in the um, black schools, I mean, because they are a step up of the teachers that are, of the students that they're teaching, because they are educated. And mother said, I'm, I'm so, I'm really kind of floored her. I mean, here's a woman who, you know, been the foreign service in World War II and, had, you know, had no vision of anything being different with anybody. Um, that everybody has something that makes them somehow feel better. Right. And that, that pops up in the Bible. I mean, that's why the story of the, the good Samaritan is such an impactful story because Samaritans were looked down upon by people in Jerusalem, by Israelites. And so this is, this is a human thing, y'all. This is not just an American thing. This is not just a black white thing. Uh, it's white on white and it's black on black and it's human. It is, it is part of, the sin that infects us. And we uh, to come to terms with that in the same ways that Laura was just talking about courage, Jesus was being courageous in going to Samaria to meet the woman at the well in the middle of the world. Being courageous and telling a story that a Samaritan is the hero. Um, you know, you probably could put those two ethnic groups side by side and you couldn't tell a difference between them um, by, by, how they, by the, how they look. So we, it's, this is that unconscious reckoning that we have to do in, in relating one to another. Sandra? I think it was interesting in the beginning when uh, Tony goes over for his interview and uh, Dr. Shirley comes out and uh, Tony's sitting, they told him to sit in this particular chair and he sits down and Dr. Shirley comes and sits on his throne. So he's above Tony. And uh, I thought, oh, there's, there's an interesting scene. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, just another little side note, years ago, John had a absolutely wonderful guy who worked with him and he passed away. <coughs> and so uh, John and I went to his funeral with um, John's assistant at the plant and um, his wife. And we were ushered into the church right up front. Uh, very interesting. And we're sitting there. And of course it was a typical black funeral and which was the best funeral I ever went to, by the way. And um, 
But at one point, Doug leaned over to John and said, I don't believe I've ever felt as white in my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, reverse right. situations, reverse situations can, can put you on the spot too. Mm -hmm. And it, there's a lesson learned there. Yeah, and it, part of the lesson I think in that is different doesn't mean less than. We're going to have different no. diets, different cultural habits, different whatever else, but, but different doesn't mean less than or greater than. And that's part of what we have, we have shaped some of this to be that men are somehow greater than women or whites are somehow greater than blacks or Europeans are somehow greater than Africans or whatever the case may be. And it's, it is not based on that. And our Christian faith says, whether you are Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And for me, that that's creating the baseline for us as, as children of God, is to understanding things, whatever situation that, that we are in, where we have these isms and differences based on enculturation, um, some of which which just come un, unbeknownst to us, um, but, but ways that we have has started thinking about somebody else that really does not follow that that Christian way of seeing each other, but follows cultural ways to, to the detriment of a healthier way of, of being together. And wouldn't it be boring if it, we didn't know about spaghetti and fried chicken? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, one of the saddest stories to me um, was Joe Golston had a nanny whom he loved more than anybody in the world. And her name was Buna. And Buna and his mother were really best friends. They spent all day together, every day. And then Buna died of a heart attack. And I didn't know what Mary, Mary Susan was just beside herself. And I said, well, you know, when is the funeral? Do you want us to come? She goes, oh, no. She said, we can't go to the funeral. And I said, you can't go to the funeral. She's your best friend. She said, I wouldn't know. I don't know how to go to the funeral. Mm -hmm. She said, mm -hmm. that they, I would make them so uncomfortable. I, I just don't know how. And I thought, oh my goodness. You know, I mean, that to me was one of the saddest things that anybody had ever said. I mean, she wanted to say goodbye to her best friend, but she would have been the only white person there. And, um, yeah, and that may that may have said, unfortunately, a little more about her insecurities, projecting what she thinks they would think on her. When I would guess, more than likely, just like Sandra was talking about, they would have welcomed her into that church, and and you know, it <clears throat> that's one of the places where you see that happening um, in the South has been my experience. Whether it's a whites going to a predominantly black church or blacks coming to a predominantly white church at times of death, at times of love, in times of condolence and, and sadness and faith. So those are, um, those are, those are hard. That was in New Jersey. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Well, Susie, I see that you're on the call. I, don't, I know you're just on the, do you have anything that you want to add to this? Well, you know, I saw the movie a long time ago. So actually listening to oh, everybody here brought a lot of it back to me. And um, there were a couple of things that I, I thought the, the point about courage is very interesting. Um, I think we've all had circumstances where, um, you know, we have felt like the minority and um, it definitely changes your opinion of, you know, how other people feel in um, different circumstances when they're the minority. But I thought one of the things that the developed in the relationship between um, the two characters is a sense of trust. And I think to get through, um, you know, crossing barriers is um, developing a sense of trust with somebody about how they're gonna treat you. And, um, you know, you, you also learn about their culture. And my best friend in Pittsburgh, um, is Jewish and it's been very eye-opening for me. Our kids have been raised together for 42 years and you know we've shared meals together. Our son went to Israel with, he was the only 
um, non-Jewish person on the trip. He went with a husband, wife, rabbi group. Um, we've done Passover seders together, and I and I've been the only white, you know, person, non-Jewish person in uh, many circumstances. And so, I think once you experience those things, you feel more comfortable. And I think part of the problem is we don't get out of our sort of environment to be put in circumstances with other people where we can develop the trust that it takes and understanding to move beyond some of these barriers that we have. And um, it's hard, quite honestly, in a place like Cashers where it's a predominantly white community. I mean, it's very different there than in a city like Pittsburgh, where you're constantly, you know, meeting people and being involved in organizations and everything like that, that are very cross-cultural. Um, but the, um, I just wanted to say two other things. One, um, I think I've, I've done a lot of sociobiology and um, this whole idea of judging people comes genetically from thousands of years of evolution as animals to how you find friend or foe. And so I think it's a natural instinct to look at people that are different and respond um, because that's what survival you know, was based on for years. So in some ways it's again, making us um, I mean, we obviously don't have to survive in that kind of circumstance anymore that we've evolved from. But I also think it's an it's it's sort of going against a natural instinct to judge people that are different. And um, you know, I think that's all part of having the courage to stand up for what's right. And um, when we know, why does it take so long sometimes for us to do the right thing? I think that's, you know, we know what's right. And um, I just finished listening to a book on um, the Lincoln, about Abraham Lincoln and um, a plot to kill him. And before he even got to the White House, on the way to the White House in, Bal in um, there were segregationists in Baltimore who were going plan to assassinate him. And um, at the end of the book, they're quoting Abraham Lincoln about, you know, when faced with darkness, reach for the light. And um, I think it's that kind of things that we're a country based on ideas, not I ideals that we need, you know, our ideals are more important than just ideas. And I think sometimes we lose the sense of what's really right and how we treat people. So I think the movie exemplifies a lot of that. Um, so sorry for my long ramble. No, that's but... good. Thank you. I'm glad you <laughs> You made the in. mistake of asking. <laughs> no, I asked. I, I'm glad to have your input. And I, I just want to say one other thing about what you were talking about, sort of thousands of years of development genetically, where we, we try to size up friend and foe. Um, sometimes the mistake is thinking that someone that looks different than us is a foe. And sometimes the mistake is thinking that someone who does look like us is a friend possibly wouldn't mean us harm sure. because they because they look like us and they do that so it it's a uh, yes there is that there is that genetic piece but all of our genes as natural as they are aren't necessarily the the best governors all the time that's why we've developed this other part of our brain and this other part of our heart that we can we can begin to overcome those with a with a sense of wisdom um and, uh, and some of that spiritual wisdom and some of that's emotional education and not just uh, intellectual education. So it's, it's hard. It's hard to overcome those, those genes. Um, you know, I think we're naturally self-centered. That's genetic. We're naturally greedy. I think that's genetic. I mean, we, we look out for ourselves. It's about survival, but some of that stuff gets torqued and tweaked in ways that's really unhealthy for us and, and unhealthy for the greater society. Absolutely. Again, just to think of a scriptural reference, when Paul is talking about we are all the body of Christ and individually members of it, you know, elbows look like knees, but they don't look like ears, and eyes don't look like stomachs. And all, I mean, it, all these things that are different, but it takes it all to work together. And that's what humanity 
That's what humanity is. And it's almost what the ideal of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit comes and it's all these people, Edomites and Cretans and Ethiopians and all this, the Holy Spirit is pouring out upon everybody. Uh, that's a pretty good sign <laughs> that what the Spirit is doing is more important than all these uh, national ethnicities and histories that, that might tend to separate us. The good thing that those people had going for them at Pentecost is they were already together. I mean, they, it wasn't like they were all separate in the first place, they were already there together. They were just being called in a deeper union. Um, and, and that's part of what the Holy Spirit was doing at that point. Well, when I was, I'm trying to think what church it was. I guess it was in, the, where did I come from? Detroit. And we had, no, it wasn't, it was right here. We had a switch night with, I never can get all the letters right, the African American Episcopal Methodist Church. Yeah, the AME. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, they all came to the Episcopal Church. And we were so, some of us that were doing this were so afraid nobody from our church would show up. And we did have a nice showing. And, you know, they had brought their band and, oh, they sang. And, and you know, you can't help. But even if you're a pinching Episcopalian like my grandmother was, um, she pinched you under the arm if you moved. Um, you couldn't help but just, you know, start rocking with them. And when Joe Goldston said amen out loud, I looked over him and I said, what are you doing? But it was, you get so wrapped up in what they're saying and their priest did the sermon and I mean, it was like, blow me away. And then here we go over to their church a few weeks later and they had wanted us to bring our choir, which uh, were about three of us, four of us have a choir and I, anybody that knows me knows I can't sing. Um, but they put me up in the back with the men that were singing bass and um, I felt like I was a member of the Four Tops. It was really like a bucket list thing for me. <laughs> because That's great. And those, and those opportunities, you know, that we have it to, was to be wonderful. To it be was together. a wonderful thing. And it was sort of, I mean, they were laughing that I was up there with them trying to do the, I mean, it was like, and I thought, wow, this really is what it's all about. I mean, you know Good. yeah and that's a level of courage and and things like that and too. they do commotion they do commotion they do communion to write one i mean i was like blown away by that i had no <laughs> idea oh yeah ame well any other any other last thoughts about the about the movie or what this movie might even be inspiring in you or any of these other movies so far that we've had inspiring in you to to, to do something or to see something differently or or to to grow into a deeper relationship with people. Rob? Yes. A, a thought that there are good people and there are bad people. And you mentioned that they, sometimes the bad people look just like us. And so you don't, you don't draw ethnic or, or uh, uh, racial lines or whatever, but when you, there are bad people in this world, and, and sometimes we need to stand up and say, that's a bad person. Don't follow what, what, they're, uh, what they're trying to uh, promote. And that's, uh, uh, it, everybody seems to want to line up either love or hate. There's a hell of a lot of difference, gray where in between the two, where you can, you can say, well, I, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic for the guy's soul, but by far, he has his way. This world is not going to be, he's not contributing to make the betterment of our world. Right. This is, this is certainly not an easy exercise at, at all. And all those, those choices, um, things that Jesus taught, you know, you can't serve God in wealth or love your neighbor as yourself. And those are easy concepts to understand, but when it comes to doing them, are, are often very complex and complicated. Like Tony said, hey, it's complicated. It is, it's, it's complicated in, in how we do this. And so cutting through the complications and, and finding that, that baseline 
uh, again, which for us as the children of God is, is the love and, and grace of God and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And pivoting off, off that and not pivoting off some other things that we may have learned in culture that we may, as, as Susie was pointing out, are, are interwoven to our being and, and hardwired into our cortex and uh, all those, all those kind of things. So we, we just have to, um, and we make mistakes along the way. So part of this is part of its repenting, part of its learning and being open to the fact that I, I may not understand everything there is to understand about the situation or these people uh, and, and, and staying in that open stance, I think is part of what is, um, is helpful. Well, thank you all. Uh, it's 11 o'clock and I think we've, we've drawn this to a close. We'll end up next week with hidden figures. Again, uh, based on a true story, it's very helpful for us to see how these relationships really um, have taken place and, and what, we, what we learn from them and, and going forward. Uh, again, I, I thank you for your participation, for the, you know, it is a little bit of a courageous thing to, to sit here and, and see um, what's been going on in the world and how we may have been privy to it and what we might need to do. So thank you for, thank, thank you for that. Uh, and I ask you to go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thanks. Be good. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Rob, welcome. thank you very much for doing this. It certainly means a lot to me. Thank you. I have, I have thoroughly enjoyed it and, and feel better. Good. Good. We'll continue to, we'll continue. God bless. See you next week. Bye. Thank you. And to you.